I'm Liam Billingham. I'm George Fragopoulos. Hi, I'm Nancy Schwartzman. <gasps> Did you know I was coming? <laughs> we, we now <laughs> Surprise. we know. And this is Oeuvre Busters. Hey, we did it. I'm sorry, Nancy. Were you were you excited about saying Uber Busters? Like you could have jumped in there if you wanted to. Yes, I, did. <laughs> I wanted to pronounce it it's right. A, it's such a pretentious word. It's so pretentious. We every this is every time we do the show, people are like, "What's the name of the podcast?" <laughs> so, so, so much so that someone who gives us money on Patreon emailed me and was like hey you should make a t-shirt that says how to pronounce oeuvre like phonetically <laughs> that's amazing yeah you and like, it was actually a friend of yours your friend one of your friends whose name would I it forget. be of if you want to do the french way oh. yeah would it be oof? No, it's, i don't it's really more like of uh, yeah it's that son of it's more of like that's, a uh, that's gonna a stress people out i feel like that's gonna stress people out even more we, we gotta work on that liam too. We should work on that. Well, you can make the t-shirts. We got to merchandise. It's all about <laughs> cross-promotional for our podcast. Nancy, thanks so much for being here. This is awesome to have you here to talk with us about what film are we talking about, George? We are talking about No Regrets for Our Youth, of course. Uh, no Regrets. No, no a- Regrets. Absolutely. From the magical year of 1946. Yeah. Uh, original title, I think, Zero, uh, zero Fucking Regrets for Our Youth. I believe. <laughs> zero, zero Fucking Regrets, dude. And I think... Uh, that was the original. It was more controversial. Yeah, Kurosawa um, rightfully so changed it to make it... To, so it could pass the censors, of course. There are actually interesting stories about the censors that we can talk about. Oh, yeah. This, this film, I was watching it. Yeah. It's 1945, right after the war that this film came out. It's like, holy shit. So groundbreaking. It's really amazing. And also, from what I understand, when 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 the production company that um, made it, Toho, came back together, they created like a strange, they created like a bureau of of, of basically censorship. That's obviously wasn't what it was called, but it was, um, Kurosawa was critical of it because it was um, very, I guess it was very communist. And there were like concerns over, interesting questions of like, the communist debate versus the sort of Western debate going on in Japan in terms of the making of the movie, which we can talk we about. I did a little reading, it. but before we do, we should introduce Nancy. Um, George, can I, may I, may I introduce Nancy? Please. Nancy Schwartzman is a Peabody award nominated documentary film director, producer, and media strategist who uses storytelling and technology to create safer communities for women and girls. Roll Red Roll is her feature film debut and goes beyond the headlines of the notorious Steubenville, Ohio high school sexual assault case to uncover the social media fueled boys will be boys culture that let it happen. Roll Red Roll premiered in 2018 at the Tribeca Film Festival in Hot Docs and has screened at over 40 film festivals worldwide and garnered seven Best Documentary Awards. The film garnered 100% fresh on Rotten Rotten Tomatoes, was a New York Times critics pick, and premiered on POV, BBC, and on Netflix. A globally recognized human rights activist, Nancy is tech founder and created the Obama Biden's White House award-winning mobile app Circle of Six designed to reduce sexual violence among America's youth and college students. Over 350,000 people in 36 countries use Circle of Six and is currently being adapted for journalists working in Mexico in partnership with Article 19 and The Guardian Project. She has presented her work at the White House, the United Nations, TEDx Sheffield, CNN, Forbes, Good Pitch, Doc NYC, and at over 60 colleges and universities. She is a graduate of Columbia University, and she is working on some projects that she will hopefully tell us about at the end of this episode. My goodness, what a bio, Nancy. <laughs> That's so long, you guys. No, it's not um, that also, long. Hearing it's... it read, I just got really sweaty. I was like, oh, <laughs> I need to just cut this down. I'm getting warm. It's uh, terrible to hear yourself be talked about at all in any context. Then, do you do that like false modesty? Like if I'm on a panel, I do the like, let me look down at my nails. Let uh, me yeah. Or do you smile? Longest... Yeah. Yeah. You're like, this is a long 45 seconds. <laughs> I was watching Jeopardy last night and they introduced the students and they just, or the people, it was students last night and they just have to stare at the camera and you're like, God, imagine being 21 and being on Jeopardy and being like (laughs) staring at the camera (laughs) while they do it. It's terrible. Uh, Thanks again for being here. This is really, really exciting. Oh, thanks for having me. Of course. Um, I think it'll be great to talk about no regrets for our youth with you. George, do you want to give us a quick plot summary? Liam, I would be thrilled to give us a quick plot summary. Uh, so No Regrets for a Youth tells the story of Yuki, a talented pianist and daughter of Professor Yagihara, 
who was forced out of his job at Kyoto University, Kyoto Imperial University, because of his anti-fascist leanings. Um, Yuki is romantically involved with two of Yagihara's students, Itokawa and Nogi, both committed to her father, but to different and varying degrees. Nogi is more radical and left-leaning, and Itokawa is far more moderate. Eventually, Nogi is arrested and sent away for four years. Um, he gets out, and he eventually reconnects with Yuki, but he is at that point on his way to China. It seems like he's made some sort of kind of agreement to get out of prison, but has kind of recanted or seemingly recanted to his leftist leanings. Um, Yuki and Nogi then reconnect three years later um, while she's in Tokyo working a series of just kind of like menial jobs. They eventually fall in love and um, move in together, I believe, get married. And eventually we find out that Nogi is involved in some sort of kind of mysterious and kind of um, anonymous illegal. or unclear uh, illegal activities. He's eventually again arrested um, and he dies in custody. She's also arrested and she doesn't kind of snitch or rat him out. Um, after this, uh, Yuki visits Nogi's parents who are villagers working in rice fields. They are pariahs because of their son and because of his politics. She eventually stays with them and kind of ingratiates herself to them by laboring with them and working with them in the rice fields and also kind of like helping them or kind of um, resisting the the kind of ostracization that the villagers are kind of forcing upon them. Uh, eventually, Professor uh, Yagihara is given his job back and Nogi is eventually honored for his activities following the war. At this point, Yuki kind of has to make a, ch a decision about whether or not she wants to kind of go back home and continue living her kind of like middle-class bourgeois life or return Ooh, to the village with Nogi's parents. That's right. I said it. I said bourgeois. We're only like five minutes in and already kind of Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. The we did it. George got it. George did it, guys. <laughs> and I'm just going to drop the mic and walk away. Um, so eventually, yeah, she decides to just kind of move back to the village and uh, work with or like uh, live with um, Nogi's parents. And she becomes a kind of almost like sort of activist. The end. Yay. Yay, I did and it. And she had no regrets for her, for her youth. youth. This no. movie was directed by Akiru Kurosawa. It was produced by Kiji Matsuzaki, who it was written by Ijiro Hishita, Akiru Kurosawa, and Kiji Matsuzaki. And the music is by Tadashi Hattori. The cinematography is Azakazu Nakai, who is the oldest Academy Award winning cinematographer. He won the Academy Award for shooting Ron. Um, and it was produced by Toho Studios and distributed by to Toho Company. Um, the cast, very quickly, Satsuko Hara plays Yuki Yagihara. Susuma Fujita plays Ryukichi Noji. Denjiro Okochi plays Professor Yagihara. Haruku Sigimura plays Madam Nogi. Iko Miyoshi plays Madam Yagihara. Um, Kurosawa mainstay, Kokuten Kodu, plays Mr. Nogi. And uh, Akitake Kono plays Itokawa. And in what I would describe as like a heat check role, Takashi Shimura shows up as police commissioner Dokai, who is just the biggest piece of shit cop uh, in the world. Um, so this is based very briefly. This is based on an actual incident in 1933 called the Tagigawa incident in which the education minister Ichiro accused Dr. Tagigawa Yokitoki of advocating Marxist philosophy and criminal law. He was suspended. How dare he? Uh, his students um, re uh, left school. Some professors resigned. But then the movement was suppressed when the education minister fired Takigawa. So that was the inspiration for this film. Um, this film stars Setsuko Hara, who had an amazing career in Japanese cinema. She uh, appeared in many films directed by Yasuhiro Ozu, including um, Tokyo Story, which is sort of his best-known film. She retired in 1962 abruptly. Um, this film was made. I feel like she's sorry. The Greta Garbo of Japan, kind of the yeah. way she disappeared afterwards and just became a total recluse. Like nobody saw her. Nobody again. saw her. Yeah. Apparently she was described as like a woman's woman in Japan. Like a lot of the roles that she took on were like quietly critical of Japanese mm. masculinity mm. and men in general. And like this film was considered a more subtle look it at that. Pretty, I thought it was pretty not subtle about the woman's role <laughs> frankly as she's hacking into the soil but we'll get to that later um and she never married which is pretty fucking radical too right she is so radical yeah, yeah. it's a radical it's a radical movie um very quickly 
uh, they were constantly hungry on set because they just did not have food post-war Japan. Jeez. It was a tough time. And there are scenes in the movie that are really poorly lit because of the electricity in the studio was was in wow. and out and inconsistent. Um, he made like four movies during the war, and this is Amazing. sort of like the the end of the that period. Um, I want There's a lot of interesting things to talk about here, but two quick little quotes. Kurosawa, when talking about the Yuki character, he said something like, at the time, I believe the only way for Japan to make a new start was to begin by respecting the self. I wanted to show a woman who did just that. And which I think is really, it's, there's a lot to, I think, unpack with Kurosawa and women. And this, this is kind of an interesting thing to talk about. But very quickly, I thought this was an, an interesting point. Vincent Camby said, uh, of the Los Angeles Times said, this film raises some disturbing questions about the nature of democracy imported from the West, along with swing music, short skirts, and Coca-Cola. Mr. Kurosawa is incapable of making anything as simple as a straight propaganda film. So there's like a lot of, lot of loaded stuff with this movie and i think a lot of it, play, see, it a lot of it plays that way when you watch it nancy did you like it uh wait did i miss a scene with swing music and short skirts and coca-cola <laughs> like that's oh yeah so the director's cut not but that's, in the yeah. film um is that mulholland drive it's, like what is he talking yeah, it's about it's a stinger scene yeah yeah it's kind oh, of a weird reaction bloopers. to have <laughs> yeah, yeah um it's 1990s yeah. swingers <laughs> yeah um i really really like the film um, I felt like, you know, just, I'm always kind of bringing political lens to everything. And as we're sort of teetering on the verge of fascism to watch, um, this window back into Japan's history as their country moved to fascism. And we know what happens. We know this country is going to go to war, but watching it through the lens of a woman who grows so much through the film, she's such a petulant, you know, she's such a petulant kind of frivolous girl at the beginning. And you also see that she's shut out of society. So the reason she can't do anything but play piano and play with flowers is she can't get educated, right? And you just watch her grow and watch her go through all these travails, make really intense choices. Um, and we learn a bit about Japanese history as well. So I, I thought it was great. George? Uh, I really enjoyed this film, yeah. It's not my favorite Kurosawa, but I'm mm. really glad I saw it. And I think... Again, I was really kind of, at first I was kind of shocked at how critical it was of like at that point, very, very recent Japanese history. And obviously we could talk yeah. about that. And then after, you know, while I was watching it, I was like, oh yes, because this film was clearly made to some degree under most likely the influence of uh, Western powers or like obviously like directly after like the war. So it was like, okay, it makes a little bit more sense in that kind of context. But that was shocking to me. Um, but I thought it was great. I mean, I really enjoyed like what it, I mean, obviously kind of, she's such a great actress. She's such a powerful screen presence. Um, she was amazing every time she was on the screen. I did the only thing I, I think where the film for me just felt lacking at points is when it did actually kind of become more personal and it became more about like the micro kind of day in day out of this person and the much larger political stuff kind of like receded to the background. And that's where, I mean, not in a just sort of like highly critical way where like, Oh, okay. Like now this film sucks, but I did feel like at some point those much larger questions were abandoned maybe after the first like 45 minutes or so. But I mean, those are just kind of like minor things. I mean, like this film was amazing. Interesting. I feel, uh, yeah, that's a cur- I, I'm chewing on your statement a little bit. Um, yeah, I just felt sure. like the much larger historical questions, and I think there's like in the very beginning, there's like this kind of large, almost like epic sweep to it that I was feeling, and not in, again, not I think in any sort of bad way, but it, it, like when it starts to get a little bit more focused on her and her relationships with these two different men and what they represent, that's where like I think for me the film like just it's it felt a little slack in a certain way that the first kind of mm-hmm. half hour forty five minutes did not. You know what it actually I think reminded it's me of? Because you're a guy. It could be because I'm a dude. Care about women's interiority <laughs> and their lack of choices. That's, well, the- you know, yeah, you want the big sweeping fascist versus moderate <laughs> versus revolutionary. I mean, I want I love her weeping this. I love in this. her partnership. Uh-huh. Like, I want her being like, no, I can handle that you're my man and you're a revolutionary and you could die at any moment, but let me cry every three minutes. Like, me- let me be the <laughs> most insufferable life partner you could have ever chosen. I was like, oh, God. But, like, that's all her growth. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you can have that big sweep. I'm going to go with the smaller details as well, you know? 
Yeah, I, I feel like for me, it, it returns to those questions at the very end where she becomes this kind of much more, I think, kind of um, self-aware and like almost self-sacrificing uh, figure. Like that's where like those kind of like much, much larger historical questions return. And I was like, holy shit, this film is like really championing like the proletariat, <laughs> especially like the Which agrarian feels proletariat. Which so dangerous. Because yeah. they don't know what's about to happen, right? Like China, the cultural revolution shit is like about to go down. And it's this fun. I feel like there's this kind of dangerous, yes, proletarian. I'm going, I'm going to be part of the cultural change in the rural areas. I was like, this sounds a little Maoist. And y'all are not going to like what Mao is about <laughs> to do. Like, so there's there's kind of a naivete. There, to me, that felt like this like political naivete. Because you're like, um, we have some perspective about, you know, championing the farmers and destroying the intellectuals like fascists did it as did the communists so i got a little nervous but sorry. i think that once one thing that's really interesting about that perspective is that or it, it but the perspectives that you're both bringing is that part of the issue with this script and part of kurosawa's problem with the film is that he was forced to rewrite the second half the second half of the film too closely resembled another film that was being made by Toho. So they were like, eh, it has to be reworked. And I don't, I don't know too much about what that, what the original second half of it looks, but it sounds as though Kurosawa wasn't happy with it. I, I, I love the film too. And one of the things that I loved about it is while I was watching it, my phone rang and my phone never rings like here. And I never get phone. Who's calling? <laughs> but my phone rang and it was a it was a local number and I picked it up and it was someone calling for um about a representative for Bur- Burbank City Council. Hmm. And which is like a big race here this year. And I was like, "Oh yeah, I can't talk now." I was and then I hung up and I was like, w- I kind of like just turned down like this political conversation to watch a movie about how like people have to live politically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like the reason I think the second I, so I think the first half is interesting. I think the sec- second half is where the movie really works the best for me because I was so intrigued by watching someone having to like figure out how to live in a in a in a political way. It's it feels like a really really powerful yeah. statement that's universal about like how do we exist in like in the reality and the day to day and like the minutia of like living in a political world. I mean, in living in like a very very clearly stated political world, which feels like quite resonant right now. I mean, it always does, but there's something about like being a few months away from election where like shit can really go down and watching this movie where this woman has to kind of figure out where she stands. Let's be honest though. I think with, for me, it was like, Oh, can we get more of like the real heroes in society? The university professors who are struggling. Amen. (laughs) I was like, that's what, like, what happened to those brilliant, amazing, oh, wonderful the university professors? Scholars with yeah. the glasses. Yes. That, with the, with the tweed jackets, leather patches. The podiums. Star Wars t-shirts. Yeah. Batman like, what about t-shirt. a film about, like, I don't know, like, a professor, a po- poetry professor at CUNY who might live in Clinton Hill and is struggling with the political kind of uh, landscape. All right, so of- moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, this is getting oddly personal. But I'm no, I feel like sweaty it's, again. So, oh my goodness! Uh, oh my I do sort of agree that it. What I liked about the film and what felt kind of potentially provocative about it was how it centered the role of this woman's life in this situation. I thought that that was really, really powerful. Definitely. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Let's talk about the fact that this is the first. Kurus- and one of the only Kurosawa movies to have a female protagonist. So he made two movies with female protagonists. One's called The Most Beautiful, which is kind of like a romantic film set on one day between a man and a woman. And then he made No Regrets for Our Youth. What do you guys think of Yuki as a character? I think I should speak for her as a woman. Please do. <laughs> Hello. Um, I found her uh, insufferable, fascinating, powerful... I loved how we got to watch 10 years of cultural and political transformation played out through her subjectivity and her choices. Um, She learned so much and we got to watch it. We got to watch her grow and make choices. And I was reading that little link you sent over about her as an actress and how she perfectly embodied our restless fear of being stuck And that really related Mm. to me. Like, you know, when she's like frantically packing up every other scene, when something goes wrong, she's always (laughs) fleeing and you're like, girl, chill the fuck out. 
But Relax. I also, yeah, just rela- there's nowhere to go. <laughs> like wherever you go, there you are. What are you doing? But I just, she was so bold, you know, and the, and feeling that not, she was totally trapped by her circumstances and she pushed herself in so many directions. Um, so I thought it was fascinating. And I, I really do love what you said, Liam, about being political in your everyday actions um, mm. and also expressing your femininity and expressing your choice. Like I love the flower designing um, scene where that's, you know, she's like kind of forced into this aesthetic flower design and they're like, oh, Yuki, you're so talented. And then she just like tore the flowers. Tears them up. Them. Oh, it's my one of my favorite moments <laughs> in the so film. So good. And then there's yeah. this really zen image of them in the water floating. And I feel like, there's a lot of great images in this movie, but one thing that's interesting is that like act of destruction where he's like, eh, 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 or she is like, eh, and she rips them off. And then you see them floating in the water and it's like as beautiful as, as any sort of like representation of them and like a uh, attached to the, you know, the branches or the leaves or it's just really keeps, it keeps changing your opinion of what you're seeing. I feel like in that regard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was kind of the first time we saw her really asserting her autonomy in a, outwardly rebellious way versus a bratty way. So I just like to mark her little areas of growth and her decisions. And I also love the scene where she had a meltdown fit and her father was so loving to her and like, was like, let's have a conversation. And Mm -hmm. he's this esteemed scholar who's taking his daughter seriously and not deriding her, even though she's serving his students tea and she can't be a student, you know, like he spoke with her, he listened to her. There was a lot of respect there. Um, I think it's a very radical female character for kind of any decade. And the fact that that was 1945 is pretty amazing to me. Interesting note about Japanese history. In 1945, women were given the right to vote. Mm. Um, it was like the suffrage suffrage started in like the 1920s and it took about 20 years and i don't know too much about the history but i did read that fact so i feel like the i mean all of the directors making movies in japan then were men and Mm -hmm. but it was there's there's like a correlation between some of the films in terms of what was made being that year and like the role of women in society and that these things were being questioned in like a Mm -hmm. kind of profound way and that way i think the movie's really maybe a little bit ahead of its time in that regard, especially for a society that is such has such entrenched masculinity at its like paternity at its core, I feel like is the way that would be a way to describe it. Uh, George. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, again, I think uh, what Nancy said is like spot on that it's really fascinating what um, how you see this character transform from the beginning of the film to the very end of it. And it's also convincing and it's all done so like wonderfully and it's just brilliantly captivating. I mean, my favorite scene, I think where the character for me kind of like totally turns is when she gets arrested herself and she doesn't kind of give in and she kind of like, re- like openly resists kind of just kind of cal- you know, like just giving over, I mean, anything she might know or not know because really she doesn't, I guess, kind of know anything. Right. But that there's a kind of this power against authority in that moment. And that's where like, for me, the character really kind of like began to transcend I guess kind of yeah the um who she was earlier on right as this kind of like somewhat spoiled petulant brat who really kind of like doesn't like want to make these important choices or like make these decisions but eventually obviously becomes this really powerful and autonomous person and it's the first time we see her hair get messed up at prison oh yeah she had the, like perfect yeah, 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 hair yeah. And it was, and she doesn't move in the cell and like time yes. passes, yeah. but she's unmoving. Like her body is just like unmoving. And then you see her start to dishevel, but it was just so interesting. That also visual transformation of her. That's when she really became like a fighter. Yeah. You know? Yeah. One thing that I think this movie does incredibly well. And, you know, I feel like the past, let's say like five or six or 10 years, we've had all these movies that like boyhood, which was shot over like, you know, three scenes for every year for like, you know, 10 years or whatever it was. And, and you have these movies that like talk about the passage of time, but like nobody does the passage of time better than Kurosawa. And the thing that is amazing about that is like, it's not like he was like, all right, we're going to rap for three years so (laughs) that all these people can change. He just like found a way to make time pass time passing become such a thing. And it's, it speaks to what I think like makes this film work really well, which is the growth of a person over time. Like the, the, mm. the style and the way that the movie's made. Like, I, I think it's really interesting early on where she has that debate with Noji Nogi at the beginning about logic and beauty. And he's sort of making this like 
classic kind of Marxist argument, and she doesn't really understand that. She's like, oh, there's something more beautiful in the world, and it's music. But then later the movie ties music to her hands being in the water yeah. after she's done these... Um, after she's worked at the rice paddy, I feel like the, the, the genius of like kind of making a political argument or a, a understanding the growth of a character's politics through images works really, really well in this movie. Um, can we talk about that piano scene for a second in the beginning when she has to choose between music and reason and then she's like, no, we'll play piano. And it's this disastrous, like Marxist love triangle where, you know, she's <laughs> forcing the moderate. She's like, turn the pages of my music. Then she... We need to acknowledge that she tells him to get on his knees. Yeah. <laughs> the, what, what, and yeah, apologize well, yeah. to her. <gasps> I was like, what is The happening? camera holds on her like, forever. What the fuck was that? I was like, yeah, I, I wrote that Marks. down. And then it didn't make it to my, the script, which was like, why does no. this, why what is this scene happen? about? Is she trying to control him? Like, cause she knows she can, cause he's like a weak willed little baby. He's just a little moderate in major quotes it's just a little like winds blowing whichever direction this was like, against she felt itakawa, right? what's that this was itakawa right if i remember correctly yeah, itakawa, yeah. Itakawa, yeah, yeah, yeah. he so the mark so noge is telling her she's you know not revolutionary enough they're just in the yeah. love triangle and then she dominates the shit out of him by the piano and i was like this is wild like i think she, the, the she was still like 20 years old and she had him on his knees. I was like, whoa, it's crazy. You guys, it is. It is. It is. It's a really weird, not weird, but kind of like, it's one of those scenes where you're like, what is going <laughs> on here? <laughs> I think the one thing the movie does really well in the opening scenes is, is cast her in this interesting light as being the only woman among, among a bunch of, a bunch of men, like her father mm-hmm. holding yeah. court with these like, He's such like a holding court kind of guy and all these like students are listening to him and they're being challenged by him. And the movie does a really nice job of having her be this kind of like, I'm bringing them all tea. I'm doing all these things. And then so to see her be like, get on your knees, you're like, whoa. (laughs) So it it kind of predicts her power a little bit that she shows later on. Yeah, it's unfocused power. You know, it's sort of she's just like flexing and figuring it out. Um, Yeah. yeah. Well, she rejects him later, too. At the very end. And he deserves it. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it, it's an honest character. Again, it's just like, re- I think we're playing that earlier scene, right? Later on when she's mm-hmm. like, like, nope, like, it's mm-hmm. not going to happen. Like, I'm not coming back. I'm not going to be the person you want me to be. There's these yeah. little choices that, well, little, there's these amazing little choices that Kurosawa makes in this movie that I feel like align interestingly with like his perceptions of the character so later in the film itokawa goes to meets bumps into yuki in tokyo and they go to eat and he's talking about nogi and he's kind of like gleefully like oh yeah like kind of talking about him like he's made the wrong decisions but he's pounding sake the entire time yeah and it's like it's this really deliberate and interesting choice to like give this character this prop that says something about him. And it's kind of similar to Nogi. He has those like classic, I don't know if you guys thought about this at all, but he was wearing like the classic, classic like ben, Walter Benjamin little frame glasses that he wears throughout that, that all these like intellectuals have in the movie. And then his gets smashed late. And there's that like really deliberate shot where you see his glasses get broken after he gets arrested. And it feels like very um, pointed in terms of what, Kurosawa was trying to get at when I was watching that sequence I was like oh like this is like you know the death of the like resistance kind of but then there's that I like I really like that point you know he does hone in and then as they rip apart the box of contraband it's just like a lady's purse Mm. you know right it is a lady's purse it's her purse so there's like a frivolity there there's a femininity there there's a you know you guys are chasing shadows she doesn't know anything. There was just something interesting about the glasses being crushed and then ripping open the box. And I was like, oh shit, what are they going to find? And it was a gift for her. And it was just a purse and it was empty. And there's all these kind of like, to that point, these like very deliberate cuts to reactions, cut to reaction, cut to reaction, the glasses, Mm -hmm. and then the opening of the box. And like, I couldn't help but think a little bit about like this idea that it's edited in such a specific way that makes it feel like 
he's referencing like Soviet era montage yeah. kind of stuff. Do you know, like it, it has this kind of like deliberateness in terms of the idea that I feel like it's trying to make in your head, which is like, he's in opposition to what everyone in that bar sort of stands for. And this mm-hmm. like occurring nas- this nationalization or that's moving through the climate. So the choice to cut to all these things. And then as Nancy, as you pointed out in the notes, like the image of the state's hatred of education, like juxtaposed with the hate is that's in the faces of all these people watching him get arrested. What did you guys, so you, so let's, let's, let's talk briefly about the cops and let's talk briefly about the prosecutors. I think this movie does not like cops. I think it does not like at the end, uh, What's his? What's the gentleman's a gentleman's name? The prosecutor Itokawa. I feel like its relationship to authority is pretty clear. Well, Itokawa is our friend from the beginning. He's part right. of the love triangle, right? And he's a very he's the more moderate who goes whichever way the wind blows, which is into power. I found him so untrustworthy. Mm-hmm. I loved his character with that sake, and then he has that forced laugh. That's really oh creepy. yeah. <laughs> and it's it's like it's so not genuine. And when he asked her out in Tokyo, and then later it was like, "Oh, by the way, I'm married." I was like, "Man, you're that guy." You're, he is. It, he does do that. He says he has guy. a kid coming. He just to me, it felt like whether it's authority in terms of the prosecutor, it's more just very slippery. Like I'm going to get in. I'm going to save my skin. I'm going to really not exercise integrity. I'm going to go whichever way I can be the safest and play both sides. That's what I really didn't like about him. I felt like it was almost insinuated he might have ratted Noge yeah. out. Did you guys feel yes. that at all? When he was like, Noge needs to be careful. That's what he said at dinner. He's walking a fine line. It's like, and what about that? And are you going to yeah. use that information to further your position as a prosecutor? Are you... Um, One thing that I think the movie does that I, I forgot about until you mentioned that is there's a brief scene with his mother where she's like, I don't want you to embarrass me. Like she sort of implies that like he needs to take a middle of the road approach because he's in college and his dad is gone and like they're paying for their lives like based. And it's kind of an interesting moment because it's, I would say in some ways he's like the villain, kind of the villain of the movie, or maybe the character I like the least. But I I think it's interesting that Kurosawa gives him a scene where his mother's like, Hey, listen, you can't be like a leftist. You have right. to like, you have to like go middle of the road because we don't, we can't survive if you drop out of college. That's a great point. That, that, and that's a beautiful scene for Kurosawa to humanize him, humanize all the banality of evil types or mm-hmm. the middle ground types that we want to wave our fingers at 40 years later. Like, why didn't you do more? You know, it's like, that's a very humanizing point. What did, okay. Why are you guys so obsessed with the cop? who never lights his cigarette, but it just dangles. Because he's, well, I I think the reason that we're (laughs) obviously sort of obsessed with him is because he's in basically every Kurosawa movie. Mm, Okay. And he plays like, he, it's interesting because he, he's, he's 38 or 39 when he makes this movie. And he always looks like he's 60, which is one thing, (laughs) but he almost, he, he started his career Uh. with Kurosawa playing like cops. It's amazing. the, The movie that he makes immediately after this or a few years after the stray dog, he plays like a more sympathetic paternal kind of cop figure. So Mm -hmm. he, I mean, he literally is in basically every Kurosawa movie. So I I had to throw it to him and he, he sort of represents, I'm starting to see that in the films he makes with Kurosawa and George, I'd be curious to hear what you think. He kind of, kind of schemes seems to keep popping up as this like conservative paternal figure or a generational figure right or in the sense like he highlights yeah these kind of distinctions between these different generations um uh yeah no but i think you're also right in the sense that he becomes a, the, he becomes another authority figure and another ways in which like this film is clearly interrogating and challenging um traditional let's say authority just uh figures and figureheads right so it's just kind of Here's another kind of person in, in power, um, clearly older, um, and clearly in some sort of ways corrupt and not at all doing anything kind of, you know, right or wholesome. So, I mean, I think it's just kind of, again, like, he almost becomes allegorical in the sense, right? Because he, like, he shows up, he's on screen for, like, what, like, 10 minutes and then he disappears. Last like we don't five, yeah, six minutes. Yeah, we don't see him again. But I think you're right, Liam. I think he's just kind of, like, another uh, representation of just kind of how 
degraded the all the authority figures for the most part are or they're like either weaklings like a lot of the fathers are like weaklings like nogi's mm-hmm. fathers is kind of like traumatized like dude who can't who? do anything nogi's oh nogi's father, father. Yeah, yeah 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 and he needs obviously yuki to come and basically just kind of show him that there's life after his son's passing um, I did love how um, all the cops are fast asleep during the interrogation, and Yuki's just yeah. like, "I am unbroken. I am right here." Like they're all sleeping on the table. Like it's very obvious, and the only one awake is uh, the main cop who actually hits her, which is pretty intense, right? Nineteen forty-five. He does hit he her. Hits yeah. her. You're like, "Oh shit!" They're showing that like brutal interrogation processes towards women. Um, but yeah, they're sleeping on the job. They like can't they can't hack what she's hacking, you know? They're dishing it out and she's taking it and they're like falling asleep, which I She starts an A cab chant. Yeah. <laughs> really intense. That would be very, very um very, very contemporary for her. I wonder what the Japanese A-cab. translation of A cab is. There's gotta be one. Look it up while I'm while I'm no, making I'm my sure. next uh, salient point. Um <laughs> you know it's it's interesting with the guy who played Itokawa, like an interesting bit of like real life business is he was like a very committed leftist. Oh, good. Ah. So when he was, I know because there's something, because we see him in this movie, you're like, ugh, that guy. But apparently he was like very serious politically and he based the character on like a lot of guys he went to the military with because mm. this film, you know, was made in 1945. And like two years before that, all these guys were playing like military heroes in like Japanese war films. Wow. And so to suddenly be playing these like, you know, yeah. anti-militaristic kind of figures actually was like an interesting thing in Japanese society because people their age and younger were like two years ago, my parents were like super into Japanese militarism and now they're like totally against it. And mm. we just don't know what to think of them and we don't trust them anymore. Which is like this really yeah. interesting kind of thing that That's happened in the country. Yeah. Um, so to the point about the scene where we see Itokawa with his mother, this movie was really criticized by everybody when it came out. Like it was not well received. And one thing that it was criticized about was like, they didn't, it didn't feel as though he knew what he was doing with the Yuki character. Like sometimes she's playing this like traditional feminine Japanese role and other times Mm. she isn't. And like the movie seems to be down on the proletariat, but like, other people saw it as a celebration. And I feel like for me, that speaks to the effectiveness of the movie as I don't, I don't think, I mean, I think it has a political agenda, but I don't necessarily think it all fits tidily into the box. Yeah, totally. Well, just going back to also like what Nancy said earlier, like, uh, like I think the final scenes are are interesting because it's not a simple like valorization. I think of like these villagers or like these farmers or like these peasant folks, because there are, let's say there's clear represent clearly a lot of these, a lot of those villagers are seen as like, being villainous for what they're doing to this family, right? Mm-hmm. Where like they're Absolutely. the family's being ostracized for the sins, quote unquote, um, of their child. So that those right. even those scenes are really complicated because, yeah, you you really feel terrible for Nogue's parents, and obviously you're rooting for Yuki to help them and to kind of triumph over the shitty uh, like place that they found themselves in or the situation they found themselves in but also you spend a lot of time being like man fuck these villagers like why are they being yeah. so shitty to these yeah. poor parents you know so it's a very it, it, the nuance and the, the, the nuance is there and it's a very i think politically um it's a politically complex film i would say yeah i mean they're not simple heroes right it's not this mm-hmm. marxist if you work the land somehow you're noble because when they destroy the rice patties which was so beautiful that scene where they're mm-hmm. first finished oh my god and you get this like sweeping beautifully lit we finally understand what they've been doing and then we see the results and the mom the village peasant mother of Noge is saying like what farmer would do this to another farmer like a farmer understands how hard this is to lay these into the earth so it's so complicated because they're ignorant the villagers the peasants and then suddenly we know what they've done six months ago now we can't necessarily trust them so there's so much nuance there I also love the scene in the beginning of Yuki's transformation to the rural community where the mother is cursing her son. That's like the mantra she's mm-hmm. saying over and over again, this cursed son, because they have to till the fields at night in the mud. And Yuki mm-hmm. has to hold on to something to give her a sense of purpose 
And the first thing is, I am no gay's wife. I am no gay's wife. I am no gay's wife. Like, that's her identity. And then by the end, it's kind of like, it will take 10 years for Japan to understand what we did. Like, what we've done, you know, we must sacrifice for our beliefs. Like, it just develop. I mean, she's just developing every scene in the film. I think it's fascinating. Yeah, it's there's like a strain. There's an interesting quality to the the what they the film chooses to focus on, which is like an individual's journey as opposed to being about like a specific body politic necessarily. And I think it's interesting how there I, it's interesting at the end of the film because there's a really cynical reading of her working in the field where it's like, well, so what? But you realize that like for her, it's important to do what she feels is like the right thing, and to live a way that that is in line with what she she feels she has to do as like a daughter-in-law as a person as a and I think it's interesting how like that idea of I am Yuki's wife in a way is a political statement Mm -hmm. for her Mm -hmm. and the choices that she has to make which I feel like is pretty profound for 1945 in a in a in a really interesting way and not to get overly psychological but but her presence heals the rift between Noge and his Mm. parents um even though he's dead like she helps them understand that his memory yeah. is actually that he's heroic and he's not mm. a, the piece of shit that's ruined their lives in their peasant village, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That scene where she brings back his remains to them and they're basically like, this is all that's left. him. it's like, it's re- it's so fucking heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. It's like such a great scene. Yeah. I, there's a couple things that I find really great. I mean, it's funny to talk about this film now. Cause I'm like, Holy crap. What a, what a great movie. Like it's, you get, you're spoiled. Like, Oh, we're watching Kurosawa movies for the next six months. Like, it's like Christmas, but <laughs> the scene where she, there's two things that I think are really interesting. The scene where she tells Itokawa that he can't go see the grave, I think mm-hmm. is a really amazing kind of moment about with politics where she's like, no, like, you're not allowed to honor this guy because you did not do right by him while he was alive. Like, you know, he was your friend. You sort of a little bit, you potentially sold him out as you pointed out. Like we don't know. And also it's interesting that no gay dies in jail. Mm. So the implication is obviously that he's tortured to death by the yeah. police. Right. So this, this moment where she tells him he can't stay is like legitimate <sighs> or see the grave is legitimately powerful. And I think it's also interesting. One thing that, rubbed me the wrong way in kind of the right way is the fact that Nogay's father is just completely helpless and sits there while his wife and daughter-in-law like till the fields. I thought that was an Mm. interesting kind of potential statement about how he views like paternity. The father. Oh, that how Kurosawa views father. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the son is just so devastated by what has happened that or the father is so devastated by what has happened that he's, he can't do anything while the women around him are like, hey, bud, we have to, like, walk yeah. the fields. Oh, he's, like, tr- yeah, he's, like, t- totally traumatized and, like, a shell of a man when sh- when you first see him. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just, I think that it, it's interesting that that, the, the way that this film deals with, like, male authority figures is interesting. Because on the one hand, you have her father who's very, like, politically aware and thoughtful. But there's also the scene where he's playing golf with the education minister. Oh, God, I mm-hmm. forgot that. Yeah. Which complicates <laughs> him as a figure, which is, like, another interesting thing. Like Politics. It's clearly he's, like, buddy-buddy with this guy, and why he has to do that is, is interesting. Is he doing that because he's giving in? Is he doing that because he ultimately believes that he has to? Like, there's interesting questions about the politics of, like, the university setting in this movie that I thought were interesting. And there's no easy answer. What did you guys think of that scene when he's playing golf with the with the yes. minister because I was surprised by it. It's also so cushy, right? I mean, there's a total class uh, mm-hmm. cushy going on here, right? Oh, you're so leftist and you're like little suit and your glasses and now you're playing golf and your dinner and your house with all the doors that my daughter keeps running through. She ran through like 17 <laughs> doors. <in that> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, yeah, the golf scene, that's interesting. I kind of forgot about it, but it because it's so out of, you know, we're in a war scene, we're in a domestic scene, we're in a rural scene. It's like, oh, and we're on a golf course. Um, yeah, I think it's kind of a class critique. I don't know. What did you think, George? Yeah, no, that's interesting. I mean, to, in all honesty, I kind of I totally forgot about the scene. But I mean, I think you're right. It's this kind of, again, this symbol or the sign of how, like, bougie he is, right? And how, like, how kind of... Um, well connected he is regardless of the fact that it, he's on his way out of the university like it's i think it's 
totally a meant to be read in that sort of way. It's just like another kind of sign of his, yeah, class politics and of his kind of identity. And never trust anybody who really golfs. I mean, come on, how can oh you? Oh my god, it's absolutely so not. Yeah. I rewatched Spotlight <laughs> it's a red flag. recently, and there's a scene in Spotlight where Michael Keaton goes to goes golfing. Spotlight? <laughs> I watch it. I watch it whenever I can. Um, Some as much light, as I possibly can. But light there's there's watching. a scene where Michael Keaton goes. Oh, it's so good. Goes golfing with his buddy, and it's an interesting thing to think about when you need to represent people in power having Sheldon conversations Gotham. that like they don't want people to hear. Why not go to a place with like a ton of land where the yeah. only people there are people like you, unless they're like working for you. It's kind of an interesting golf represents like an interesting thing in movies. Well, it's funny it's too, that, like where those seats of power, like, you know, in, in cultures that use public bathing, I actually thought about this in the film. Like mm. how come there's no scene in a public bath? Um, because in Finland, there's been complaints that there's a lot of backdoor deals that go on in the sauna and like, women board members mm. can't be part of those. Um, so the men are all hanging around naked in towels, but they're like, yeah, yeah, you can get this position and I'll give you this. And it's the equivalent of the golf course in Scandinavia. So mm. Japan has public bathing as well. So golf is yeah, a very like specific Western choice, right? To put them there and not some somewhere else. Kurosawa is also often accused of being the most like left. I'm sorry, the most Western yeah. Japanese director of the era, and a lot of people, a lot more like you know, sort of left leaning. His politics are are not easy to decipher from his movies, but I think a lot of the more left leaning Japanese directors of the time kind of viewed him as like you're kind of like you want to make movies like the like Hollywood does, which is, I don't think holds up to scrutiny, but I think it's a really interesting. Uh, way to look at him especially in in light of a film like this two what two things i want to talk about uh i mean in general i want to talk about this movie for hours but there's two interesting things that happen and they're they're both sort of closer to the end and one is the moment when yuki uh decides to leave the house during the day and she's running and all the people are looking at her and there's a moment where she falls on her knees and it cuts to all these shots of trees and wheat and fields and they're mm. they're like laughing and i at first it was like oh okay this is interesting because the the, the people in the town are laughing the kids are laughing but it like almost transcends the 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 simplicity of like oh look at these people laughing like i felt like in some weird way it wasn't just that the people there were laughing but like she was kind of up against history in some weird huh. way that he was kind of like, this is a person evolving in their time. And like, she's a woman, it's 1945 women are voting. This war is over. And like, she has to deal not only with like the weight of what's happening in the town, but like the weight of everything that's happened in the culture up to this point. But why, the, why the cuts though, to like natural phenomena and not to, let's say shots of, let's say her back in Tokyo, like memories of like her in the city. Well, she has to battle yeah. the earth kind of, like mother nature is actually in charge, right? Always. We know this. And maybe that's a mm. statement following the atomic bombs. Like, I don't know, like something about the mm. earth reclaiming, like the earth is always in charge. If you're a farmer and it doesn't rain, you are fucked and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, those branches that she's carrying are so heavy. She's like, she might be crushed by her fantasy of going into the earth and into the land to survive. Like I read that. I love that you're pointing it out. Cause for me at first I was like, Oh, it's just the, you know, it's just sound editing. You know, it's like the villagers <laughs> they're behind right. the bushes and, you know, but it is sort of like, do you, you know, maybe the politics of man didn't break you, but the earth could break you, you know, the elements could break you. Yeah. Like I saw more of like a, uh like a contention or a battle with mother nature. I mean, not necessarily maybe history and that kind of sense. Yeah, you know? no, I see your point. I guess I feel as though there, there there's, there's some, there feels like at the very least there's a larger statement going on, but totally. I, I think in a way, yeah, there, there, it feels as though Nancy's right in that it's kind of about the nature and earth and those kind of elements, but it, it feels very provocative all of a sudden in the middle of the movie to be like, what? It's weird. It's what kind is of going creepy. On? Maybe he was like, I feel like throwing in a weird horror sequence. It's like, right. Right here. Well, Nancy, it, it weirdly made me think of the shots in your film where you have the text messages over the shot of the, 
of the like land and the earth mm-hmm. like or like of, of the town mm-hmm. where the story takes place mm-hmm. and just go like oh like there's this weird kind of banality to the to like these images but they're juxtaposed against like the mm-hmm. laughter or these horrible things that people are texting each other about like it, it feels interesting to watch filmmakers like draw a correlation between like basic banal life mm-hmm. and like what is going on and i feel that mm-hmm. this film does that in that moment yeah that's really i mean because we're watching her in slow motion get crushed like i was so yeah. rooting for like is she gonna make it like her body is hunched it's emotional it's physical it's layered and then i kind of love that an 80 year old lady just grabs the bag and chops off <laughs> yeah you're just like let's go she's like uh-huh. Let me take the backpack full of sticks. I'm out of here. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you have the dad back at home just like, Doing I'm sad. nothing. Yeah. I'm sad. I'm sad. I'm having feelings. Really, motherfucker? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. You're kind of hitting on what we were talking about earlier, which is like, I, I just, I didn't, I was sympathetic to him, but I was also much more sympathetic to his wife who's like, let's go. Do let's go. Work. Let's go. Well, she's the one that's I'm, working. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. What does she weigh? 82 pounds? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Rest, like we're all traumatized. That's also kind of like COVID metaphor, Trump metaphor. It's like mm-hmm. we are all traumatized. We're all going through our own stuff. Everyone has backstories. Everyone is bringing a bucket of sticks on their back. But like, who the fuck is getting up every day and doing the work, <laughs> right? And like, in whatever way you can, sitting in, you know. And of course, the dad's. I love that he woke up. But what does he wake up? out into is rage and anger the acceptable male emotion right that right he stumbles out and you're like what's he doing and then he's tears the sign you know he's angry that was such a crazy moment i was really analyzing dad's face when he did the whole kind of turn of the face i was like is this super overdone in a good way or super Mm. overdone just in an old-fashioned like people don't act like this anymore on camera but I mean, his face is so interesting. You could just leave the camera on it just to mm. study it. But, you know, that was his only emotional response was like rage, um, which I think as is, opposed to resolve or something useful or a tear or sad or grief, right. like that's or, the a t- yeah. core of it, right? Is like I'm devastated and paralyzed and old. Like there's a lot that he has. So I thought that was kind of a really powerful critique of masculinity and the old guard of masculinity in a way. Yeah, I that's kind of what we were like we uh, is that there's 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 that and then there's also the fact that Yuki's dad at the end of the movie yes. is like, "Hey, I'm a I'm a teacher again. I decided yeah. I decided uh, to Liam, come pr- back." Professor professor please, oh, please right. professor. Mm. Please, Not please. elementary school teacher. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, How he's dare like I'm going to be Liam. I'm going to be and then he sort of makes gestures at Nogi being an important figure and it's 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 something that the people are critical of the film like why do we go back to him at the end of the film? It's not his story and But we but only for a the, minute like yeah but it, it feels very important to the movie in a way that or it feels if it, it's given a lot of weight and it's interesting that they make the decision to have i mean it, it it weirdly makes sense within the context of the culture but that he gives this speech about remembering this guy while she's like doing the work kind of to yeah, like that's interesting keep keep the family afloat and he's like don't remember this guy and fight for your ideals which of course like is great it's it's valuable but the students are kind of it's like he just kind of returns to teaching he he's in the second half of the film he doesn't seem to know what he to do with himself he's like oh i got to go to the market and buy stuff oh i'm going to represent nogi i think that's the film's fault in all honesty or like fault i mean i think like i think it clearly is saying something about the character but yeah at that point you know really that's what i was kind of saying about how the film feels like very different to me after the first like half hour 45 minutes where it leaves that stuff like really behind and then it really becomes like yuki's story like entirely Mm-hmm. And I don't so mean you that wanted a, more of it. No, I just wanted I want wanted more of it. I think I wanted more of it, like um, a grounding of that, or just I think maybe just kind of like even maybe less of it because then it, it's clear that we're like completely and utterly um, seeing all of this through Yuki from the very very beginning. Yeah, I, just, I guess maybe just hmm. my sense of it. Yeah, I mean when we cut back to him on the podium, I 
I mean, maybe Kurosawa's kind of rolling his eyes, not sorry, George, Possibly, saying yeah. it, at the uselessness of the academic class. No, I'm just kidding. But there is this thing suddenly. Finally, where- finally. <laughs> finally, Liam has ah, an ally. I've been wanting to say this for years. <laughs> no, but we've, we've literally been in the trenches. She's been in the trenches yeah. with another old lady. And then these guys, and it's a sea of great looking men in like yeah. oh my god they're all like so handsome Thanks. and their suits are so nice and they're just like perfectly dressed i also just want to point out right so you're in the sea of like perfectly you know manicured and tailored men who do not have mud under their nails they do not have mud i love when yuki's in her silk shirt and she hits that mud and by the end mm. she had tea in a glass by the end she is guzzling it out of the pot like she's just like hardcore and then we cut back to these men who are clapping, honoring the man who died for being, for yeah. acting on his revolution. Like, no guy's dead. He's not just not there because he's hanging out in Kyoto elsewhere, right? He's just like, yeah. he's dead. So He's been murdered by the state. Yeah, yeah. But let's all, he should be here. And just a little note about that interesting janitor character, huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's some very digging class critiques in this film i think but he's like kind of revolutionary and then as things transform he's left out of the conversation mm-hmm. yeah that's i think there's I a totally really good, forgot about that yeah he was interesting to me i was like huh why are we learning that he's the janitor but he's let in oh now he's let out so i think it's kind of critiquing the like hypocrisy of the academic class and in He's in the background, like cleaning up and bringing in tea and stuff in that early scene, which is yeah. kind of mm-hmm. interesting. And you know, he's like, "Oh, I'm I'm for this," and they they all kind of clap, but they're not like, "Please sit at the table and talk Share with us your about your beliefs." Yeah. There, one thing that was interesting when you mentioned the silk shirt is that the movie has this interesting conclusion where Yuki goes back to see her mother and father in in Kyoto and you see her dressed like Yuki before for Mm -hmm. a minute and it kind of it's like throws the whole thing into sharp relief because you're like oh yeah this is the person that she kind of like she lived this is the life she lived before and the fact that the film takes the time to like go around in a circle and bring you back and then you see her jump on the back of the truck and I I found it interesting at the end of the film there's a to me there's like a little bit of ambiguity when she gets on the truck and she's facing all of the people that live in the town as they're driving into the town and, and the camera cuts to them all smiling at her. But at least for me, I had this moment where I was like, can she trust these people? Mm-hmm. I really felt like a sense of dread in that moment under yes. under the the sort of feeling of like community that that they appear to be they appear to be trying to portray. Mm-hmm. Um, I, didn't felt, sense... I felt like a darkness to it. Really? I don't know if that was way off. Yeah, it, it, I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't at all. I yeah. felt like oh, I she d- was about to become the mayor of the town. They were, yeah. I mean, you know, they were like, oh, she had like a valiant, heroic kind of leap onto the truck and mm. an acceptance. Yeah. I got a real feeling mm-hmm. of acceptance and with a side of leadership. That was. Is hard. that because the one guy turns her and he's like, yeah, are you ready to come to our Midsummer festival? <laughs> It happens yes, once every exactly 35 why, because years. Because a man from the 2018 <laughs> yeah. feature Midsommar shows up at the end of 1946 regrets for our And years. she's like, I can't wait to go to this Midsommar festival. It sounds great. Will there be a bear? I still yeah. haven't seen that movie. I haven't seen it. Um, I'm too scared. Liam, can you yeah, me too. I can't, it's great. I can't do it. You guys have to watch um, it. It's great. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that I'm wrong and that I read too much into the ending. And it could be that I've... I've seen too many movies where like the villagers end up being monsters to <laughs> children. I'm like, Oh God, I've, I've seen Dogville too many times. Um, the worst. but it, yeah, there was something about it, but I think that, I think that that, that my reading is, is, is off, but I was like, I found the ending. I was like, Ooh, I think it's your gonna happen nature here. coming to the surface. It is. Lady. Oh no. I mean, Very classist. Right. I'm wearing, guys, I'm wearing a bat. I can't be classist. I'm wearing a Batman <laughs> t-shirt. <laughs> um, Wait, I just want to show you guys that Yuki inspired me because there are these flowers ooh. that grow outside by my just out back, and I put them in a bowl. And they ooh. smell so good; they're just gorgeous. They're what just, what kind of flowers? You know, I'm new here. They literally grow out by the dumpster of my trash because it's <laughs> L.A. You're like, oh, the dumpster flowers. Yeah, um, I, there might be kind of magnolia. Maybe they smell so good. But watching her tear the flower and dump it into water, I was like. I'm gonna try that. 
Huh. That is nice. I should do more stuff like that around here. Well, you're starting to garden. Yeah. yeah you got I need to become one. It's going to, um, it's going to save me. Here's my, my other planner. Save me from myself. Ooh. That one. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Guys, uh, guys, if, if, for those of you just listening and not seeing the video, we just saw a beautiful plant. Nancy, will you tell us about any upcoming projects that you've got going on as we wrap up oh. here? Anything you want to tell us about? People can watch Roll Red Roll on Netflix, correct? Yep, that's where they can watch that. Um, I made a slightly more lighthearted short film. Uh, it's not that lighthearted, but um, it will be coming out on Mother Jones. It's a 15-minute kind of verite short following a family of hunters. So um, in rural Tennessee on a deer hunt. Um, and I kind of just cool. looking at like Second Amendment and hunters' rights and guns and deer and bullets and stuff and um it's gorgeous it made me cry doing the sound mix because i miss being like running around outside and you know having a little freedom um i am publishing a book a kind of good deeper dive on uh reporting on the steubenville story with a kind of deeper focus on the case and also where are we now as a country sort of 10 years later so that's coming out um in 2021 with hachette which i'm terrified because I'm like writing a book, but I'm also really <laughs> excited about that. Um, and I'm attached to direct an investigative project with the Center for Investigative Reporting, which is exciting and I can't talk about it all. Um, and then there's- So others. tell us more. No, I'm just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, there's all there's there that other thing I can't talk about. Um, yeah, but the short I'm excited So you're about. busy. It's different. Yeah. You know what? This week I've had a brain and it's been so nice to have it back. It's like, oh my God, I can like write, I can focus, I can do things. Oh man. It's so at- touch and go. Yeah. You guys And the, the Mother Jones thing is already up and running? No, it will be up soon. We're, we, uh, oh. we'll hopefully play a couple festivals too. It's called oh. One Shot, One Kill. Yeah, baby. Oh. And don't tell anyone, but I copied the font for the title from Deer Hunter, of course. <laughs> but of course uh, I won't tell anyone that doesn't <laughs> listen to this podcast well nobody really listens anyway oh, good. So. stop it so that's not true tell you guys everything. what a way to go out George what a way to end our like we have this like hour long interesting conversation sorry with you're like but uh sorry no one's gonna hear it wait sorry. wait shouldn't we end wait I want to end with Yuki's line that I wrote down that I felt so aligned Ooh, with please. this week it was so good I want something do it throw- okay ready I want something I can throw myself into, body and soul. That's the kind of work I want. Ooh, heart. Heart emoji. Heart emoji, film emoji, ghost emoji, pot of money emoji. um, Rate, review, subscribe to the show emoji. (laughs) Uh, Really smooth transition. This this was really great. Um, Nancy, thank you. I'm I'm so glad you joined us for this movie. I was Liam Billingham. I was George Fragopoulos. I was Nancy. Oh, sorry. I was Nancy Schwartzman. <laughs> Keep that. And off. this was <gasps> Nancy. Uber Buster. Uber Buster. Uber. Uh, yeah. Uber.